Now, um, I want to say that tonight is going to be so rich. Um, I'm not going to talk much about myself, but I want to say that Africa, we call it Mama Africa. Mama Africa. Statistics have shown that the population is just good enough and that Africa is so rich, especially when it comes to our culture. With the 54 countries, we got ethnic groups, we got different languages, we call them dialects. So one, somebody could be speaking and I will not understand because of their, you know, where they come from. So I want to say that the heritage is so strong. And I always say as an artist, no matter where you go, carry your first ID card with you, which is your, your, your culture. And I always say your culture is your identity. Trust me, I have seen in the United States my own sisters who can't eat with their fingers. Trust me, I will ask you to pay a fine. <laughs> there are certain things that we don't play with when it comes to culture. For example, there are times that I want to walk bare feet. I feel so comfortable with it. Trust me, I'm not crazy, I'm not mad. But especially when I'm dancing, my traditional dance, I can't put on these shoes, it's not, it doesn't fit. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. So those things, the way, okay, when we talk of culture here, like the African culture, we don't only talk about the food. We, you see, see the way I'm dressed? Don't you like it? Yes. <laughs> Come on now. Yes. This is African Heritage Month. It is a tradition in America that each community manifests its identity. The African, it's not the African Heritage Month, the Heritage Month recognizes the presence, contribution, and achievement of a demographic population. Today, in this era, it's no longer America the melting pot. Is America the salad bowl? Please, I would indulge your patience to stop eating right now and just let's get into the program. The African community is a new and emerging population. As I said, America is no longer. A melting pot is a salad bowl. It is incumbent on each new community to identify itself, maintain its unique culture, and what happens is that it goes through the Congress, then to the White House. It doesn't become a National Heritage Month except it is signed by the sitting president. In September 2008, we initiated that process. And I'm proud to say in the house, are my partners in crime, Chuk Salienu, Edwin Udenbro is here, record history as it is. In October 2004, Chooks and myself and a couple of people who went to Montgomery County. We said our population is increasing. We cannot be assimilated into generic African American community. No, we're not trying to differentiate ourselves. That's not the issue. We're just trying to manifest ourselves. We made that argument. Some people thought we were a troublemaker, and I'm sure we're giving good trouble. But I'm gonna go back. Before that, 
we had pioneers in the community who have been doing great work. Adam Lulegren, a legendary leader in the Malian community is here. She is a pioneer and continues working, and she's in the media. So, as a population is growing, we went back and did the research from 1935 when Kwame Nkrumah and Nam Zikwe studied in Temple University in Pennsylvania. We took from that period that period to the 1970s, the population of the African Im immigrants were rare, mostly F1 students. It started changing in the 1980s. We had pioneers who did not start, like Le Suleimanye, Mama Nita, Dien. A lot of people, we walk on their shoulders to come this far. So it's not a race who gets the first is a relay. A generation comes, nurtures, and hands over the mantle to the next one. So as the population grew, we started fled in some hours. <laughs> it's okay, it's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> so so we try the ignaters, especially the African Americans, because they think that to identify ourselves we are diluting the black power. But that is not necessarily so. We come with some asset that we can contribute to the black pool. But I didn't think so. Marion did not think so at that time. So when he ran into trouble, he came back in, he needed new friends. So we took advantage, we ran a marvelous campaign. So when you won, we were recognized it as the African and Caribbean Committee under the Office of Diversity. I think the director was Ayo Bryant. So, the Africans, we have smarted the Caribbeans. <laughs> <laughs> so we're fighting Caribbean, the Africans, under the Office of Diversity, under when Mar um, Anthony Williams came, the Africans, oh, we're great. What Africans don't have in any other thing, we make it with colorfulness and exuberance hope and optimism. We ran a good campaign, Marion won. Uh, we ran a good, uh, we even put in number of candidates. Anyway, to call a long story short, we got some, the politicians started noticing us, and we put together a team. To call a long story short, we got the Office of African Affairs. We left the Caribbean behind. We got unanimous vote. I can remember December 2005, then in February 2006, we went door to door. Carol Schwartz was there, Katla, you know, we can remember the old school. But we got unanimous vote, and in March 2006, we got the Office of African Affairs that addresses, yes. that addresses the issues of the African immigrants and their descendants. <coughs> Right, there I say, I'm running to trust. The Prince Georgians did your magic in 2002. Yes. They ran a brilliant campaign, and the winning candidate, Jack Johnson, said he would not have won without the continental Africans. We organized under the African People's Action Committee. Right? Yes. Am I right? It yes. Okay. So, you, you know, in, in this, uh, um, um, you know, in the DMV, um, the primary is the general election. Because a Democrat will win. So if you win the primary, you are sure in the general election. Mm -hmm. And you can win by a plurality vote. Because there are many candidates, you can win by 30%, even 25%, you get most vote. So that is where the Africans come in because we are, where are you called the swing voters? Swing voters. Okay. America's <laughs> We're not um, a monolistic group with head mentality. We competed, and my opponent was actually my classmate in general. Joe Ayon for Silverman, Evelyn Joe for Ivan. Like it. Like it. You and Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> so we won that campaign. So they had 
the officer, the African American liaison on the 10 o'clock. So after we won, I commissioned Black Summit, Middle East Summit, Asian Summit, Hispanic Summit. We didn't see a continental African summit. So they started calling us. I'm like, I, you've got to be kidding. We campaigned, no, don't take this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can do so. So we campaigned as continental Africans, and now you're telling us that we are going to go into Black Summit? They said yes. So the tour, I, there's a girl called Evelyn Jo, she's giving trouble. You know, that's, who is she? What does she think she is? I said, I don't know what you think I am, but all I know is that I'm not going to go on the 10 o'clock. So they said, they sent General Bander to call me to talk to me in this general black, all the civil rights people. I was afraid to go alone. I called Chooks. So Chooks, let's go. <laughs> so we went there. And we all said it. Chooks brought the data. So the data man is going to tell you guys about the data. So Chooks brought the data to show the pattern and everything. Alex Taco, she had an accident, he cannot help. So we made a case. Bruce Adams, um, Professor, no, Bruce left when I retired. Um, a, a new crew is there. So, to cut the long story short, we prevailed. Oh, see, the Africans are pulled by the bootstrap, cultural resilience. No, they funded the other, they did not fund the continental Africans. We funded it. We used Chooks' data. We made a case. So that's how we got our own liaison office. The said, Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing. Never shall, never will. You have to go there and get it. And when you get it, African Heritage Month. And saying that I'm just trying to say that just as the Jews and Latinos and Hispanic fight for their own share of the table, we do that. We do that not because we don't want to be identified with the African Americans. We do that because we cannot even have a equitable partnership with the African American, the Hispanic, if we don't have an identity. Who do you partner with? So that is what you call participatory democracy, or uh, equitable relationship. So we went and said, do not speak for us. We can speak for ourselves. That if we have some common need, we're going to work together. And that is the wise man, Edwin Adunko. So. So the Latinos started noticing, other communities started noticing this new group, whether we were rascals or radicals, but it worked. So, so they started coming to us, even La Casa de Maryland, Gustavo Torres needed our support to get the, um, the headquarters, Edwin signed. So that is how you build relationship. You have to have a self-esteem <coughs> knowledge of self. Now we have some bragging rights. We are the most educated ethno-demographic group in America. Don't believe me? Believe the sense. So we do that. They call it the Asian miracle. What is the African miracle? We've got that. We work hard. And we should be proud of ourselves. Yes. that to a subsequent generation. So we used to ask disaggregated data. When they say black kids are failing, no, we, our kids perform at the rate of the white and Asian kids. And this has brought some kind of resentment if we say disaggregated data. My sister, I love you. We are not taking your thing. 
<laughs> there is no other than Rufus Stevenson. He was a diplomat, American diplomat. He went to Africa and fell in love with Africa and behaved like even double spy because they couldn't understand why he was always interested in the um, African cross. So, we do not understand the African American history, but we have more in common than what divide us. Yes. For example, the Harlem Renaissance. It was an explosion of the black culture. My, my. Sorry, you know, arts, history, literature. And the African the Harlem Renaissance influenced Negri too. Yes, yes. Led by yes, Senghor. Yes, yes. And so there was a confluence of influence. Yes, yes. The Black Pride and their partnership is what is a story that continues. Without much ado, I will welcome Mr. Rufus Stevenson, and he's gonna do a poem. It says the fine is a final call. The final call by Langston Hughes challenges each and every one, each community, to take responsibility for their own, to shape their own destiny. I go buying down Malaika. We're in the Swahili house, right? Yeah. Malaika. Poverty campaign. Send for the fairy queen with a wave of the wand to make us all into princesses and princesses. Send for King Arthur to bring the Holy Grail. Send for Mad Moses to lay down the law. Send for Jesus to preach the Sermon on the Mount. 
simple dream is to cry, Jacques, Jacques. Sing for dead blind lemon to sing the B flat blues. Sing for hope spear to scream, Syra, Syra, Syra. Sin, God forbid, he's not dead long enough for the mumma to cry, Freedom now. Sin for Lafayette and tell him, help, help me. Sin for Denbaugh was he saying, free. For Sank saying, run a new flag of the mask. For old John Brown who knew slavery couldn't last. Sin for Lenin, don't you dare, he can't come here. Sin for Trotsky, what? Don't confuse the issue, please. Sin for Uncle Tom on his mighty knees. Sin for Lincoln, sin for Grant, sin for Frederick Douglass, Garrison, Beecher, Lowell, sin for Harry Tuppen, all such on the truth. Sin for Marcus Garvey, what? Sufi, who? Father Divine, well, Dubois, when? Malcolm, oh, Stokely, no. Then send for Adam Powell on a non subpoena day. Send for the Pied Piper and let him pipe our rats away. And if nobody comes, send for me. We have a keynote speaker, the president of the Economic Social Council of the African Union, the Ghanaian chapter. Let me tell you something about the African Union that some of you have gotten it right. The African Union is made up of organs. You see, uh, I'm sure you know about Arikana. She was under the, the commission. The commission is not over any other organ. The organ that was uniquely constituted by the African Union Constitutive Act to deal with the civil society is the Economic and Social Council. And it is made up of representatives. So the national chapters constitute the General Assembly. Without fear of contradiction, I can say the most powerful functional national chapter is Ghana. Yeah. And my country doesn't even have one. So there are few. Um, when Ghana was instituted, um, by the foreign ministry, he's well known, the Honorable Doche, the African Diplomatic Corps were all there, the persons, and he's a strong advocate. <laughs> to give this keynote, we couldn't find any better person from ECASOC. Yes, yes. And he's going to be in November, mm -hmm. where we're going to have a bigger event on the theme of the year, arts, culture, and heritage as levels for development for the Africa we want at the intersection of every development is culture. It informs our politics, our economics, <coughs> even our spirituality. Without much ado about nothing, the Honorable Samuel Confidence Dojia. Yeah.
Put the microphone over there. So, uh, greetings from the <coughs> African continent, specifically from the Gold Coast, Africa. West Africa, a beautiful country called Ghana. With the capital Agra, I want to take this opportunity to express my personal gratitude and uh, sincere appreciation for Jakete International for the wonderful work which has been initiated over the years. As the president of the AU Epos of Ghana chapter. It is a privilege to share a few thoughts with my brothers and sisters far away from Ghana. But because of technology, we are seeing each other, observing each other so as what? if we are seeing. Can you put the song for the computer? The song for the from the computer. Our language. How does culture influence our behavior? How does culture influence our behavior? I always ask you that the African culture is unique among cultures. It is in Africa that you see the woman. Beautiful dress in the hair gear and going through the puberty rights, which is unique for social economic development. We, as people of Africa, we must cherish our culture. We cannot develop when we throw our culture away and begin to adopt other people's culture. We have to help you with the sound. Let us go like the house. Dr. Kobe Kuma and the late Dr. Kawunda. And the rest of the What they have done for this is supposed to be coming through him. I therefore want to say that we cannot develop on the sun. Here? Yes. This modern era, where we don't uphold the culture of our heritage, all our life, our existence, the beautiful and the unique culture that define the character of an African man, that define the character of an African woman, that define the character of an African man, that define the character and the totality of an African. That is why in any part of the world you find you see an African that culture, the food, the supposed to be connected here. So it's always connected. We need to switch here on the computer. On the computer to get the sound out of here. We celebrate unity in diversity. And that unity in diversity is a catalyst of economic development. That is where you can find a Cameroonian, you can find a Ghanaian, you can find a Nigerian, you can find a Togolese, you can find somebody from TRC, you can find somebody from Senegal, you can find somebody from Trinidad and Tobago. All of these people coming together to celebrate the unique culture that you 
promote development back at home in Africa. It is my wish, it is my hope that you don't throw away the rich culture of Africa, the rich culture of your ancestors, the rich culture of that open civilization for the world. It is not for anything that you have to uphold the cultural heritage of your continent. It is not for any reason that you have to uphold the cultural heritage of Africa. Everywhere you find yourself, you must prove to the people that you come from a continent that good cultural heritage ah, is a very supreme unit. Brothers and sisters, by what I'm seeing on the screen. But that's wrong. I want to tell you that hold on to the African history, hold on to the African heritage, it is the best legacy that has been created to our generation. And it is only when we have all this beautiful cultural heritage, then we can play with us my name is um, Christine Quine. Um, and I'm from Cameroon. I'm the national president of Lesser USA, which stands for Lord's Ex Students Association. Um, in um, well, the school is in Bamenda, and I know that what's what was your name? Or what, what is she here? Who sang with a beautiful voice? She's uh, like, Kim. Oh, she went out. Okay, Kim. When Kim was talking, she talked about from DC to Bamenda. And um, I don't think that was a coincidence. There's a connection with everything we do and everything we say. Uh, a Lady of Lords is in Bamenda, and it brewed and brews till this day very powerful women. Um, powerhouses, geniuses like Evelyn Joe, and, and, and many others who, wherever they go, they do. They make sure that they impact the area or the space they're occupying. So in 1991, the older, those who had already come ahead into America, um, they decided that they should start uh, an alumni, and that was started in, in, in the DC area. Um, it started with maybe four, then it went up to about 20 girls, and then it, it began to grow. And in 1990, 1999, they decided that it shouldn't be limited to DC because um, when they started, they were doing conventions and meetings, and all the girls would fly and come to DC, the other students. So they decided to encourage chapters to be born. And so in 1999, was born Lesser USA. And today we are 22 years old um, as, as Lesser USA, but close to 31 as an association. Now what happened is we were, it, it was born that we cannot be in America and not remember where we came from. And, and to come up with projects like scholarships, to the students who do not, who are underprivileged, um, to those who at that time, AIDS was the main thing. So the students who were orphaned because they had lost their parents to, to AIDS and all that. So they said, okay, let's, let's do little things, little um, fundraisers. 
and get money and send back to a school and do scholarships and maybe help out with the school, maybe repairing what needs to be repaired, repaired or empowerment. But even as we grew, so our, our thirst for empowerment grew also. So in about 2006, or we, we started applying in 2003 for 301, C? 501C, I'm sorry. 501C, yes, C3. 501C3 to be able to get larger monies from our people here, our friends, our families, um, our Americans um, who we had already made friends with. And then they were able to have it taxable. So we were blessed. In 2006, we got approved. And but before we got a pool, we still continued doing what we're doing. But we came up with this project that what about changing the water system in the school? The kids used to get up in the morning, like 5 a.m., and um, carry buckets to go get water to take a shower, and then at the time, they don't even have real clean water to drink, and so we thought. That what about doing a water project that not only will bring water to the school for that time, but forever. And then also um, changing or, in, or improving the sanitation of the school. So, well, when we looked at the budget, it came to about 150000 And we here we are thinking now, how do we raise 150000 I was, you were told that I did a bunch of accents. But, you know, being, and I actually, I thought to myself before I came here, I was like, you know, I think I'll just do two accents. I see that currently we have Africans, we have African Americans. Okay. So, I thought about doing a version of how an African mom would react or how, and how an African American mom would react. Being that I'm actually both African and African American, that's from Afri um, Cameroon, mom's African American. So I grew up both cultures, so I'm just gonna do both accents how one re one would react. So, where is your mom from? She's from New Jersey. Wow. She's from Atlantic City. And is that where they spring from? To get her McDonald's. So first we're gonna do the African American mom. <clears throat> oh hey baby, how you doing? Oh yeah, I'm on my way home with what'd you say? You want McDonald's? You got some McDonald's money? <laughs> well, girl, if you go if you don't go do them short okay, first of all, I then told you we got food in the fridge. Stop calling me about this McDonald's mess. You better go get you a McDonald's job. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to get nothing. Okay, okay. I'm going to do two. Okay. Okay, now we're going to do an African mom. Hello? Uh -uh. You want my donut? I, I chop this for fridge. Why you go? Why are you calling me? I I have already cooked last night, and you're calling me with this McDonald. Okay, when I get home, I will cook. No, we are not eating out tonight. Okay, we're not. Oh, hold on, I'm getting another call. <laughs> 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 yeah, I did on the other line of my. I gotta get home and charge my phone at home. <laughs> okay, so I'm kind of contemplating what kind of mom am I gonna grow up to be? <laughs> Yes. 
Uh, for those of you who are not aware, the entire month of September is declared as the Africa Heritage Month. And that is not a diss to the February uh, Black History Month. Just like the Latinos have their Latin America Heritage Month, and the Asians have the Asian Heritage, or they call it Asian Pacific Heritage Month. And um, when I came to America the first time, many, many, many years ago, and this was at the eve of Jimmy Carter's administration, I went to school in Oklahoma. I don't know how many of you in the room have been to Oklahoma, but when I arrived, in the part of Oklahoma that I arrived at, they barely seen a black person before. So, I took a bus trip to tour America. So I'm one of those few people that have been privileged that except for two states, I have been to every state of the United States, including all of its territories. And as Evelyn had indicated, one of the things that I learned is that the African American heritage and history and culture is intertwined with many aspects of the American history. But there are also many parts of the African American heritage that never departed from their ancestors from Africa. So when I went to South Carolina, uh, places like North Carolina, and I learned about the Native Americans walking on foot all the way from Florida to Oklahoma and Arizona on foot. Can you imagine walking on foot, right? And, and I'm just talking about Native Americans, we're not talking about African Americans now, right? They also did the same thing, right? Selma. In fact, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, a, a lady, uh, Dr. Virginia, who was one of the youngest African American girls that marched, very first march that Martin Luther King did. She still lives in Atlanta today. What are we doing here tonight? We're not only celebrating the conclusion of the Africa Heritage Month, what we wanted to do was to also make sure that there is an understanding. There is a lot of confusion. I had the pleasure of having an argument with Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton right in front of the steps of the Capitol Hill in 2005. This was, for those of you who remember, when we had the largest immigration rally on the National Mall, half a million people. And the argument was that Africans or continental Africans had no issues because the African Americans represented them. And true, they did. We would not be here. And if Evelyn didn't highlight that, let me make sure that I do. That we would not be here if it were not for you and your forefathers and the struggles and the blood and the marches that you did. But if you had listened to some of the things that Evelyn was sharing, she was not sharing about disparities. So that may have missed in the conversation. What she has been sharing, or what we are trying to convey, is that if you take a pizza, a pizza, pizza pie, she called it salad bowl, I, I like to use pizza. What has been happening, going back to the American history, Please note that American history does not go beyond the 16th century. You can, Americans cannot tell you what America looked like in the 14th century, in the 12th century, in the 10th century. They cannot tell you that. But we in Africa can. We can tell you what we, with our ancestors, were doing. So what has been happening is that in America, other ethnic groups 
whether you call them the Latinos, whether you call them the Asians, whether you call them the Caucasians, have been taking parts and pieces of this country and they've been sharing it amongst themselves, except for the blacks. And what's been happening is that every time African Americans stand up and say, I want to be counted, they say, well, here's one slice. And that's all they give you. But what ends up happening is that other communities are getting more than one slice. Because there are Latinos who say that they are white. They don't call themselves Latinos. So they get two slices. They get one slice for being Latinos, and they get another slice for being Caucasian. And then there are Caucasians. And then of course you have your Asians. So it is only the African Americans that only end up getting always one slice. So what we want to showcase for you, and the case that we have made since 2000, 2001, in various communities, is to say that Africans, or the continental Africans, are here to help you enlarge the pie. We want you to get more than one slice. But if you stand up, they will say, we already give it to you. So you need somebody else to stand up so they can give it to them too. So since Evelyn and Edwin and Stanley, and these are names you will probably hear most of tonight, we've been doing some work since 2000. So at that immigration rally, at the National Mall in 2005. I remember the Washington Post asking me, well, we thought these are Latinos. What is a black person like you doing here? Why, why are you here? The African Americans have their own issues. And I'm like, no. African Americans truly do have their own issues. But I, as a continental African, have other issues that African Americans do not have. And I'm marching with these folks because my issues are not being represented. So we have spent the last 40, 50 years trying to make that case. So Kwame Nkrumah came here, studied, and left. Azikiwe, several other notable African heroes did come. Yes, Mandela did not come, but we consider him one of our heroes too. Yes. But that case needs to be made that the continental Africans, the African diasporans, have a need that is far beyond the African American issues. We share those same issues with you. Civil rights, racial justice, equity, and all those other things that Martin and all of the others, you know, Lewis, Malcolm, all of them, all those things, we share that with you but we have additional things that you don't represent. And that's where we come in. So that's why we make the case that continental Africans must be recognized on their own, not as a group that is intent to diminish the African-American journey. No, that's not what it is. It is actually to enhance, to elaborate, right? So Thurgood Marshall came, right? Um, uh, Moses, right? The lady nicknamed Moses had walked. We are here to actualize what they dreamt about. So when continental Africans come, we don't come with baggages. We actually come with a ladder. And the only thing we ask you for is to show us the wall. We will lean our ladder on the wall and we will climb it to the top. And also, one of our pioneer chairmen here who started getting us involved in politics, Dr. Onye. What actually happened in politics? You have to know your interest. You don't have to permanent enemy. And also, for you to grab power, somebody don't give you power unless you show the force of power. And when the new 
immigrants or foreign born led by our group, we decided to coerce with the Latinos, the Asians, and also the African Americans. As a, as a matter of fact, when we are drafting our Bible, the gentleman who is an Anglo is an Irish. When he looked at our bylaws, he says, how about myself, how about the white people? I said, no, we're not against All we are saying is that, what we are saying that we have what we call a sheer common interest. If you can take away, your own, you know, if you can come and build with us and share the same interest you have, so let's all of us have a common interest. We go, you're going to be a part of the group. So my point is, when you want to negotiate power, when you want to get involved, you have to know how to build up linkages. Link, link, link. The person who has that power will never give it to you. See what is happening today in Congress. See the war that is going on there. See what the progressives are doing. They're telling the, you know, they're telling the, no, this, this is not as usual. So, that has been the game. Brothers and sisters. Who am I? I do not know. Who am I? Why do I ask? Who am I? From where do I come? Who am I? Why? Why do I ask? I, I, I have no name. I, I know no home. Where are my roots? I must have come from someplace. I, I must have done many things, but I'm not sure. Until I find out who I am, I can't know where to go. Until I find out who I am, I wander to and fro. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Thank you so much. We choose. Thank you. Yeah, we choose something that talks about your time, Professor Kelsey The legacy. Beats his legacy, beats the time. And this is your work. <laughs> Many people have read your work. Yes. You or we could not condense your work. It is immortal, so we gave you this little placard. Professor Kelsey, Kali, the man, the mentor. The moments. Oh. We'll frame your work for you. Thank you so much. Yes. And before Dr. Stanley Grenier closes, we want to honor a young woman who understands the pain and the trials, and she's one of Professor Kells Kali's students, and Jack Kinti, MUIPS employee, and then is MK the Poet. No, this oh. is here. This is MK, this is MK the Poet. MK, we don't understand. We don't understand is an example from the This is a poem I wrote about my life before and after I was in foster care. It's called Rough Around the Edges. My dad was a drunk. 
always sipping on that Hennessy. And I would love to go back and change what he did to me. All the stuff that happened, I remember vividly. I dwell every day, that's what those flashbacks did to me. But it's okay, because I know that I'm a soldier. And I get stronger each day that I get older. Each day that I think back, my heart gets colder. My dad walked out my life and I didn't even get closure. But now I'm working two jobs, my ambition up to the ceiling. Sometimes I love too hard because the lies, they sound appealing. I try to keep up, but then my head starts spinning. I don't worry about the pain because I'm popping and I'm winning. They say the early bird gets the worm, but I seem to wake up late. And when I showed up to the cookout, I couldn't even eat a plate. They say I didn't deserve it, so as a kid, I never even ate. Arguing with my conscience, it's for like the great debate. My dad was a fool, he locked me up in the closet. He deprived me of food because I wasn't honest. And that's no excuse to knock a kid unconscious. But I thought it was my fault, so I argued with my conscience. And then I started to think everything was my own fault. Even when my dad locked the fridge with a dead bowl. I had to eat bologna by itself because the bread gone. Couldn't put sugar in my cereal, so I add salt. Then I got worse, I had to sleep in a dog pen. I wasn't allowed out and no one else allowed in. And he knew that this was cruel and unusual punishment, but he didn't care that harming a child was a sin. He's so crazy because he didn't want no babies. Well, he only wanted sons, and he told me this daily. And the world is full of a lot of things, a lot of ifs, a lot of maybes. And maybe one day he'll start to treat me like a lady. At the age of 13, I could have sworn my name was Ho. No, that's not my name, but that's what he called me, though. He made me feel like no one wanted me for sure, and then he proved his point one day by walking out the door. He dropped me off one day and left me with my mom, a stranger that I never knew, so I tried to stay calm. She started spitting Bible verses like Corinthians and Psalms. I felt like this woman had the key to my life in her palms. I only lived with my mom for two months, then got put out, got put in foster care because she knocked me out, was quick to put her hands around my neck without a doubt, and the neighbors felt my pain because they heard me shout. Then I struggled being a ward of the state, where the government don't love, all they do is hate. I went from house to house with no food on my plate, wishing soon I could see the heaven gates. I tried to stay strong with all my might, but then I even tried to take my own life. Cause I was so sick and tired of putting up a fight cause the stuff that happened to me wasn't right. Then people started saying that my heart was so cold, that I was going to die lonely when I get old. I felt like a slave that was not good enough to be sold, but when my words come out, you would think I'm so bold. See, I'm black and I'm beautiful. Please don't call me wild. And just cause I'm hurt don't mean I express it out loud. I wish I could escape and float on a cloud. Forget you, I'm about to make God proud. But it's not like me to want to be who I'm not and try to pretend. I'm my own ride or die. I've been there since this began. And I know it's kind of long, so it's about to end, but I need to get this on my chest so you know who I am. 23 years I've been struggling since I was put on this earth. But I've been a star. I've had talent since birth. See, I get tired of the pain because sometimes it hurts, but I'll never let nobody devalue my worth. Amen. <laughs> Good evening. Good, evening. Good evening. This is a wonderful evening. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. What this has shown me is that Africa has arrived. Yes. We have arrived. You know, one thing that we are known of, I will tell you a little story after I introduce my beautiful wife sitting over there. The reason why I'm introducing her sitting over there, Carolyn. Not only is she well educated, is she from one of the richest families in Nigeria? She also works for the federal government in a very sensitive area. If she does not approve what she does, Nigerian government military does not get it. That's the power that we Africans have in the United States here. That is the power but we have been able to misuse it somehow. Before I go on, ladies and gentlemen, let me acknowledge, I want us all to stand up yes. for Evelyn Joe. Yes. Please. I know what I'm talking about. You know, I get a little, a little queasy. A little queasy when I... Here people say, in the 90s, what we did in the 90s, 
I wish Edwin, Edwin would start telling you what we did in the 70s. <laughs> yes. He was not born. <laughs> you know, one thing is that the United States was not born in one day. Right, right, right. Nobody will tell you that we arrived in one day. After all, I can stand here and tell you that the foreign minister of Iran, after the fall of the Shah, was my roommate at Georgetown University. Hi, my name is Amisa Asima International. I am based here in Washington, D.C precisely Maryland. I am here tonight to enjoy myself. We are celebrating the cultural evening for Africans and Americans. We are together. We talk about unity in diversity. Africa is the world in miniature. We are so rich in our minerals, in our cultural heritage, in everything. And that is why we came here today to celebrate the night. And you see around, we have food, we have drink, we have danced, we have sang, we've got some good knowledge about the African traditions. And trust me what, we are one. Africa is rich, very rich. We are here as one people and we'll continue to live as one. We come a long way. I want to thank the African-American family for accepting us. We are one. Thank you so very much. Welcome. Welcome. The purpose of this event, the African Heritage Month, was to put together a committee that is going to sponsor or submit the sponsorship of the African Heritage Month through the Congress to the White House for it to be proclaimed as the National African Heritage Month. It has been a fantastic program and we hope to continue until the sitting president proclaims the National African Heritage Month. Thank everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Rufus Chafing Stevenson, and I'm the founder and the vice chairperson of a 501c3 nonprofit called Jock Kinty International. My vision, our vision as, as uh, Jock Kinty, is to nurture and promote the cultural spirit of Africa outside of Africa in the diaspora. And it's my pleasure to be here this evening uh, to be uh, celebrating the African Heritage uh, uh, Month event. Uh, uh, I, I did a poem tonight called Final Call by Langston Hughes. And uh, it's about responsibility. And in this day and age, we as Africans, whether we are living in Africa or in the diaspora, we have the responsibility to come together in the spirit of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Ghanaian Adikwa symbol, Sankofa, reach back and fetch it. So, using the word responsibility, we as Africans in the diaspora and in Africa, we have to come together and reach back and fetch that responsibility that we all must have in order to bring the spirit of Mother Africa into reality, in unity. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Marilyn Pierre. Okay. Hi, I'm Marilyn Pierre, and I just want to tell you about this great event that I attended today. It's called the African Union. It was put on by Evelyn Show, and oh my gosh, it was so amazing. I learned so much about African his the, the continent of Africans' history, and I learned about the African diaspora that's in the uh, uh, that's in the Washington metropolitan area. And we are doing really, really wonderful things, and we hope to keep on doing those wonderful things in the future. Please come and join us. We would love to have you. Bye. Okay, my name is Terence uh, Atem. Uh, I am a CEO of Likudu and a business uh, a person in a business owner in Washington, D.C. and Maryland. Uh, this is such a great event. I've known uh, Miss Evelyn Joe for a long time. Uh, I've known her for her activism, leadership and mobilization and this is just one of those great events that she would, you know, I would expect her to put together. Uh, it was vibrant, very energetic, uh, power driven and focused and there was a sense of uh, community. 
uh, and we just wish that the younger generation would pick up and continue this journey uh, to try to make uh, African, you know, uh, uh, Africans uh, in the diaspora, uh, specifically in the United States, uh, involved politically. Uh, again, this is such. It was a great success, and I, I'm just grateful to be part of it. Thank you. Hey, my name is uh, Dr. Stanley Onye. I am of African descent. This evening is just a wonderful event where African diaspora come out in full force to galvanize, to talk about their future, and to talk about what we have contributed in this community. African community has really been a guiding force in this place. Our families are growing, our numbers are growing, our political influence is also growing. I thank Evelyn Joe for organizing this this evening, and we want to be able to commemorate African Month to show what we have done in this community, to show what we have done to this country. We have, we have brought a lot of resources to this country. We have brought a lot of family get-togethers in this country. So African immigrants have arrived, and we need this country to also embrace us as we have embraced the culture, as we, as we embrace the way of life, as we have been able to build a solid foundation here. First of all, we say thank you for the land that accommodated us. This land has accommodated us, given us all the good things, giving us all the hope, and giving us all the resources that we need. We have to help our African countries so that they will also become what we think Africa ought to become. Nobody, nobody can take away the resources Africans have and the good thing God has endowed in that continent. We also want our people to get together, to be represented. Our numbers are growing, our population is growing, our families are growing. The American land has nurtured us, has protected us, has given us all the resources. Some of us are doctors and lawyers, business owners and entrepreneurs. We also want to contribute to give back to society. What we are asking for is recognition to be able to take care of what others have been taking care of. There is no reason why Africa will not have a national declaration by the president. The president should declare the month of September as African month so that it will be celebrated all over the country, so that the countries will be able to be able to celebrate, know the resources Africans have done, know the contributions we have done. Most of all, we are grateful to this land that has nurtured us. We are grateful to the system that has accepted us. And we, have, we are grateful to the American people that have accepted us. All this we are asking, all what we want to do to get a piece of pie because we are contributing our quota in this community. This is a closing event. September is African Remembrance Month. We want it to be a national month. We want all Africans all over the place to celebrate this month as a month of our inclusiveness, of a month of our recognition, and of, of a month that we will say thank you to the country that have shielded us. God bless all of you. God bless America. God bless African continent. God bless all the citizens that are here. God bless. On the occasion of the African Heritage Month, uh, we are here to uh, celebrate this occasion. Uh, sponsored and organized by uh, Sister Evelyn Joe. So indeed, we're very happy to be here. And I'm going to pass on the microphone to my wife, dear wife, Angeline King Bandon Bibum, author of uh, Sojourner's Dream, Lamentation of the Warrior. Okay. Thank you. We're so very proud of uh, my big sister, Evelyn Joe. And in, in sponsoring and, and putting together this this occasion, it's um, very good and very informative. Uh, we also witnessed uh, the display by uh, baby uh, baby daughter Lucy Bandon Bibum. We're so proud of you, and uh, that was quite a good job. Also uh, added by uh, cousin. Uh, uh, Dylan family, oh, oh. Everybody, uh, uh. Hey, one family, oh, oh. one family. Put your hand like this. <laughs> one family, everybody sing. One family, oh, 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 oh. one family, oh, oh. African Americans.
say, one family, oh, oh. one family, oh, 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 one family, oh, eh. African American, African family, oh, oh. Hey.